Hello and welcome to this post on Viking archaeology in which I review our new book which came out a few months ago, this one, River Kings, written by Kat Jarmond. This is a book which is really a delight to read and one which I think many people with an interest in Viking archaeology will enjoy reading. Kat Jarman, uh, who I've met several times at conferences and workshops, uh, describes herself, uh, is described as a bioarchaeologist specializing in the Viking Age, Viking women, and Rapa Nui. I didn't find anything about Rapa Nui or Easter Island in this book, so that must wait for another one. But bioarchaeology, the Viking Age, and women are definitely three key words of this book. The text is nuanced and detailed, but not in any way dense. The opinion presented is balanced and I think when there's two sides to a story, Jarman is more likely to explain why both have a point than to try to sell who, who, you, uh, her preferred point. She also uses herself extensively in the narrative and tells about her own research and uses that as a way to invite the reader in and I think this works exceptionally well. The starting point of the book is set in Repton in England where a mass burial from the Viking Age was found in 1982. And Jarman uses this as a cue to tell the dramatic narrative of the Viking Great Army that was active in England in the 860s and 870s. A lot of bioarchaeological work has been done on this assemblage, including ostology, isotopes analysis, and ancient DNA analysis. And Jarman has been a key researcher in this research herself. But the point that she picks out from this assemblage is a Carnelian bead which was found in or with one of the uh, burials. The bead coming perhaps from India or Afghanistan becomes appointed to the fact that there is a much wider chain of contacts behind the Viking disruptions in England in the middle of the ninth century. And Jarman sets out to discover how close these connections are and how they would have worked. This brings her on in the second chapter to finds of Islamic dirhams and weights that show that the Eastern contacts are in fact a sustained presence in England. And in this way, the many new detective finds also become a part of the narrative. In the third chapter, she visits the big detector site and Viking camp at Torxi and introduces remote sensing and geoarchaeological methods. In passing, she also discusses the uh, earliest Viking raids in England and pleads for the view that Alcuin, who related about the Lindisfarne raid in seven, 93 uh, actually said that the Scandinavians were long familiar with England. This is a point which was argued many years ago by the historian Peter Soria, and I don't quite agree, but that will be another post uh, for me to tell. In the next uh, section of the book, she sort of move, moves on to Scandinavia for chapter 4 to uh, 6. However, apart from what you could call a mandatory visit to Birka and Hedeby, and the Norwegian uh, Viking ship burials. I think these chapters already looks very much to the east beyond Scandinavia. Chapter four is mainly about finds of Eastern objects in Scandinavia. Chapter five zooms in on the question of Viking Age women in general and on the now famous uh, female warrior grave Birka BJ 581 in particular. And chapter six is already heading across the Baltic to Gotland and the Salma ship burials in Estonia and the trading town of Staria Laduga in Russia. I sort of missed out a little bit a deeper look into Scandinavian Viking Age archaeology in these chapters. In particular, it's a bit weird that Denmark is largely passed by despite the fact that the Repton warrior, which is singled out in the first chapters, uh, was revealed by ancient DNA to have probably had a Danish origin. I think there could have been some great bits of history to pursue here. I understand that Jarman uh, has her own story to tell and a lot of ground to cover, but I really hope that she'll return to uh, Scandinavia some other time in, in another book. The last part of the book then goes east. Chapter 7 tells about the Rus, very much based on written sources, and of course, even Vatland's famous account of the Rus burial at the Volga. Chapter 8 uh, takes us to Vipovsiv, in the Ukraine, where the author joined an excavation in 2018. And here the book really becomes, or begins to come full circle. Here she uh, encounters mobile warrior groups that would not be too different from what she found in Repton. 
And importantly for the narrative, she finds a parallel to the carnelian beat uh, that she used to start off or kick off the narrative. She even returns to the metal detector finds in England to discover that uh, there are more Eastern types than has been realized. This is a real suspense story, actually, and one of the most compelling chapters of the, uh, the book, I think. At some point, the narrative gets a little bit carried away by some of the campfire stories told in the Ukraine. So at one point, for instance, uh, the role of Scandinavian warrior groups in the East are explained with reference to the old truism that Slavic tribes were farmers, not warriors. And this has always been a popular myth with some circles in Eastern Europe, but I don't think it's a very accurate statement, and it's actually sort of contradicted by some of the stories also related in the book. At another point, uh, Jarman celebrates uh, the women buried in Rus double graves, and also the famous story about the Rus queen Olga as examples of women's agency. To me, the graves in question don't suggest loving embraces, as Jarman writes. It looks more to me like the females are being treated as possessions there. And um, the Olga story is rather one, I think, of a very patriarchal and gender divided society, which was quite picky about kinship and social hierarchy, sometimes to the extent that they would accept a woman as a custodian of a ruling family if the male head of the family was away or had yet to come of age. I know that's not a very inspirational reading, but I think real history just isn't always inspirational. Chapter 9 arrives at the heart of the Byzantine Empire, the capital Constantinople, today's Istanbul, or Miklagat to the Viking Age Scandinavians. Um, this chapter also digs into the consequences of globalization, or proto-globalization, if you will, of the Viking Age. And Jarman here has saved another original point for this chapter. When she re-examines a re recent DNA study, and is able to argue that there may have been a very close connection between Viking expeditions in the East uh, and the first arrival of smallpox infections in Northern Europe. In a short epilogue, uh, Jarman puts herself back into the narrative as she goes to Gujarat in India to find where the Cornelian beads which started the tale came from and how to make them. As I said in the beginning, this is a great book to read. Every chapter tends to feature a recent discovery or a novel uh, scientific technique woven together into a tapestry with uh, written sources and material culture. This is a very effective way to integrate new archaeoscience into Viking studies. And one of the real strengths of the book is the way it does just that. One minor letdown is the section with references, um, which for some reason is very limited. And sometimes I struggle to follow the base of some of the things uh, written or some of the ideas presented. The title uh, River King is not really uh, explained, but I take it that it refers to somebody who holds power by controlling a system of trade and communication. The subtitle, A New History of the Vikings from Scandinavia to the Silk Road, puzzled me a little bit at first because to me uh, a new history would su uh, suggest something that was very encyclopedic and boring. And this book is neither. It's not meant to be uh, uh, to be bringing together everything we know about the Viking Age. And it's definitely not boring. But uh, the more I read about it, I uh, thought about another meaning of history here. Um, the original sense of history or Greek historia is finding out, uh, and in that sense, um, Herodotus' history, for instance, is a journey to find out a fact-finding mission. And I think that's just what this book is. Uh, it reminds me a lot of Herodotus' famous travel of the Greek world uh, to find the reasons for uh, uh, the, the Persian Wars. Another book uh, which this reminds me of is the Renaissance humanist Montaigne's Essays. And this is meant in, the very, in a very, very positive way. Every chapter here can be read on its own like an essay, diving into the subject and drawing on the author's personal experience and thoughts and putting that into the text without feeling compelled to cover a full subject exhaustively. And I think in that way, it is a real uh, humanities uh, experience. Um, 
and a treat to read. So if you want to keep company with the Herodotus or Montaigne of Viking studies, this is a great book for you and I commend it to you. Thank you for following me on this uh, post and I hope you'll return back for more posts on Viking archaeology.